Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. Great. Thank you so yeah. much for such a, a, a kind introduction. And, and it really is an honor to be speaking to you all today. The organizers have done such a fantastic job of setting up such a high profile program of excellent speakers week after week. And it's a real to be included within that. So thank you so much for the invitation. So today I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of looking at, at what makes our species, but, but approaching it from perhaps a slightly different angle than you've you've maybe heard about through the program so far. In particular, I want to focus on kind of the, 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 the environmental context of our species and how they compare to other hominins. So we're all aware and, and uh, of the last, last human evolution is really driven by high profile papers that often come out relating to fossils. Um, obviously, we're, we're keen to always find the earliest member of our, our species evolve. Um, which, um, what time did it evolve? And, and, and the picture in Africa is becoming particularly exciting in this regard, showing that it, it likely emerged as a group of very different um, diverse populations over time. But then also the other question is then, when did it get out of Africa and, and, and looking uh, the sapiens then move beyond the continent um, and how it interacts with other hominins. And often when we're trying to look at what makes our species unique, the starting point has, is, is its fossils, is, is it's the, the brain case relative to other hominins, this more globular shape, um, as well as other shapes and traits of the face compared to other hominins. Alternatively, obviously increasingly as, as new methodologies push forward, another key source of, of how people have been defining our species is looking at gene, you know, genetic, whether that's ancient DNA or trying to work back based on modern DNA. Now, obviously, this is becoming increasingly difficult given that, that this information in our species was able to interbreed with other hominids, perhaps even debating the degree to which they're separate species altogether. Obviously, the most prevalent things in the archaeological record is material culture, and so there have also been attempts to try and characterize what makes our species unique um, in terms of types of material culture, whether that might be certain ways of making stone tools, certain ways of using technology. So for example, composite bow and arrow technology or symbolism, symbolic beads, uh, artistic traces and things like that. But the problem with all of these sets of evidence in some ways is that it's always going to be challenging for us to find the first example of them. The archeological record means that, that almost inevitably we will never find the earliest in a given area. This makes it quite, quite difficult to, to really just focus in on when and where we're, we're finding these things. And it becomes increasingly important to try and build up some kind of context they're arriving. And I want to just illustrate this with a, with a sort of brief example. So I believe you've already had a talk in relation to the, the Mislaire cave. Um, remarks of now what are probably the earliest Homo sapiens fossils anywhere outside of Africa. And it's obviously made big news um, and, and quite Quite right. But one slight problem here is when we're talking about a sort of out of Africa experience, particularly during the Pleistocene, politics were obviously not adhered to by, by Pleistocene members of our species. So, okay, yes, yes, we're finding the earliest Homo sapiens outside of Africa, but what does that actually mean in instance? When we actually turn to a more biogeographic approach, we can see that actually the fact that our species could make beyond Northeast Africa and Israel is perhaps not as impressive as, as we might first think, right? When we look at the environmental context today, 
those are species that already crossed far more by, by geographic spread across Africa than it did to necessarily then get to Israel at that point in time. And I think in general, one of the problems has been um, in, in a focus on hyacinths, on fossils, and um, the earliest type of material culture, as well as genome evidence, is that we're almost completely missing the context. What, what environments are we finding these? What environments are we finding these early forms of material culture that mean different things about human societies? Because only then can we begin to understand the degree this shows that our species was using different habitats and the degree to which that's important, the degree to which, okay, we find them in another place, but did that require a significant um, adaptation? For example, in, in this case, if these environments were the same in the past, actually it would have been a range expansion that almost any mammal or indeed animal could have actually made quite easily. So should we then really be focused on the fact that this out of Africa example was, was early and, and is that so impressive or unique to us? And of course, ever since Darwin, the, the definition of, of what a species is has been intimately tied up with its ecology and its environment with these, um, these sparrows that he first studied. And so I find it quite remarkable in, any way, in many ways that human evolution in, or a lot of high impact human see are missing that crucial environmental data that we really need to get to the bottom of if we're to understand where and how our species was emerging. And indeed, I would argue, and, and potentially controversially, that the, the real smoking gun of our species that, that makes it distinct from other hominins is the fact that only hominins who actually have occupied all of the world's continents by now. And that even by the late Pleistocene, we had occupied nearly all of them. And we'd occupied almost all of the terrestrial that are species uh, that, that is available on planet Earth. And this would fit into the sum I'm pointing towards on the broader scale that, that perhaps the origins of first the genus Homo and later our species are intimately tied into the fact that climatic variability was in Pleistocene. That while perhaps there were not so many swings between glacial and, and interglacial states or, or the periods within those, they were in fact more kind of see from that plot on the, the far right hand side there. And that actually the environment that our species was, was evolving into was actually already a species that could adapt to more dramatic climatic swings, that could adapt to more um, intense environmental variation. And the fact that we came to this, this process Perhaps it's unsurprising that we should expect that our species may have been uniquely good at these things. And beyond broad scale perspectives, other scholars have recently made a move towards discussing this concept called plasticity. And this idea that our species is perhaps not necessarily unique in the sense that it do certain things, but the frequency and flexibility with which it could do those things. And I think that's becoming an increasingly important topic, particularly as we see of Neanderthal art, for example, or arguments that even Homo erectus in Southeast Asia was producing symbolic material culture. That if those certain things are no longer unique, perhaps it's ultimately the frequency of those things and the flexibility with which they are applied that is best seen as where our species differentiates itself from these other. And so this is the hypothesis that I want to sort of present to you today. Um, myself and Brian Stewart published this as a sort of, uh, we used a sort of jargon term in inserting it, so we called it the generalist specialist, that our species is the sort of ultimate species that could generalize in the sense that during the Pleistocene, it could come to inhabit different environments. But it was also a specialist because certain populations were able to specialize at the same time in certain extreme environments, such as forest high altitude settings and deserts. And what I want to do today is to try and really back up that, that, this sort of hypothesis um, and also describe some future avenues forward in which we can keep testing this. And I really want to highlight that we, we certainly did this hypothesis as a hypothesis to be tested. Our main goal of this was to actually try and get these, the, these high impact papers start focusing a little more on what are the environmental contexts of different hominins so that we can really start to get to the bottom of this question. Okay, so obviously the logical place to begin with then is what is the information do we, that we have in terms of environmental context for non-homo sapiens adaptations? And in this focus on other species within the genus Homo, 
moving aside to one for one moment that potentially all of all of these species if they can interbreed are actually the same species and put that to one side and go with the genetic definition that there is enough genetic variability that we qualify as a different species so what do we have here then so the neanderthals are obviously longest known of, of both our closely related hominin species and, and even contemporaneous hominin species that we came into uh, interaction with. Now the shape of these, which is sort of seen often as being quite round and a bit sort of smaller stature than Homo sapiens, has often been linked to a unique ability to deal with extreme weather. So on the face of it, this might already refute the hypothesis that Neanderthals were actually remarkably adapted to certain environments. But what's quite interesting is that Actually, all of the paleoenvironmental evidence that's actually found directly associated with Neanderthals, it almost all comes out as sort of mixed grassland and woodlands. Now, these might be quite different, so you might have slightly drier grassland and woodland environments in and around the Mediterranean. You might have um, slightly colder grass environments towards the northern edges of Europe. But in general, they're all relatively similar environments and showing a sort of broad use of these different settings. There is, of course, this, this recent paper you might have seen showing that Neanderthals also exploited, were able to exploit marine resources uh, on occasion so that they clearly were able to, to, to practice quite complex hunting and foraging behaviors. But this still does not quite a, get us beyond the point that really almost all of the environmental information for Neanderthal sites, if not all of it, shows a sort of broad adaptation or situation within mixed woodland and environments. The same is broadly true of the other uh, members of the genus Homo to have arrived sort of both early on and, and to present in Southeast Asia at the same time as our species. Now, early on, the arrival of Homo erectus or in, in Java or very early around one million years ago was, was seen as a potential that this hominin was actually using rainforest environments. More so Homo floresiensis or the hobbit, its body size was even itself linked to tropical forest environments with sort of there being a convergent evolution seen among other populations that live in tropical rainforest A and historically where there have been arguments that this kind of slightly small stature is a good adaptation to tropical rainforest that either it deals with high disease loads um, it deals very well with the th necessary thermoregulation, um, or even that it deals very well with, with supposedly resource poor environment. The rainforests have often been characterized by both anthropologists and archaeologists. But yet again, in both these cases, when we look at the actual paleo environment evidence associated with these different hominins, we find that firstly, Homo erectus is found in almost all of these sites in association with, you guessed it, a sort of mixture between grassland and woodland environments with perhaps some patches of tropical forest animals being found alongside Homo erectus as well. And that actually the broader is now of Homo erectus arriving in this region is actually that it happened at a time when grasslands were expanding and it was following other large to medium sized game that really liked these open settings out into Southeast Asia and even as far as the Wallacean areas. And amazingly, the same is true uh, for actually currently for Prusiensis. The actual environmental evidence indicates that it was living in, again, a mixed tropical forest grassland environment, likely scavenging slash hunting large, as well as big birds um, that were actually, oh, and it was actually itself hunted by these big birds that also uh, favor these open environments. So well, it seems that although there were hints that other hominins might have been living in these more difficult settings, Actually, the current information that we have um, once again suggests more mixed grassland woodland use of different environments. Um, and perhaps even more emphatically has been this recent um, publication in Nature that shows that Homo erectus actually survived remarkably late in Southeast Asia, even as late as into roughly around 100,000 years ago or a little before. But what's remarkable is that these authors then concluded, well, actually, this, this sort of last appearance takes Homo erectus right up to one of the major paleoenvironmental changes that happened uh, during the Pleistocene in Southeast Asia. And that was when around 100,000 years ago, more open grassland settings were suddenly swamped by dramatic expansion 
of tropical rainforest. One that is really identified at the, the so-called Penung fauna, but really brought in all of the modern Southeast Asian animals we know today, it's like the orangutan. And so by this argument, they even, they even make the argument that actually this might have been what even finished Homo erectus off in the region, that it's so long within these more mixed environments, but suddenly that this rapid expansion of rainforest is what actually ultimately drove Homo erectus to extinction at a time when our species was beginning to get into this region as well. So that's quite an indicative um, suggestion along these lines too. Perhaps most interesting recent evidence in terms of other hominin adaptations is in terms of the Denisovans. So this is obviously, I'm sure you've heard about the Denisovans and, and this is the, the sort of, it was discovered based on this very small uh, finger bone or very small metacarpal um, as a result of ancient DNA analysis in Denisovan cave in Cyprus. And it's known from very, very few fossils, but you might have seen very recently in 2019 that it was argued that a jaw um, identified analysis could be associated also with this hominin group. And on this basis, this jaw being found uh, in a cave high up in it, it was argued that actually Denisovans may have been well adapted to high altitude environments. This is also potentially revealed by the fact that it's argued that the Tibet and genome uh, of, of modern humans that live in, in, in Tibet has actually been influenced and, and their high altitude adaptation is influenced by some genes that came from Denisovans, perhaps again suggest Denisovans were adapted to high altitude settings. Similarly, identification that Denisovan DNA has also made it more disproportionate into modern human populations that live in and around Southeast Asia, but particularly Oceania and Australia has been used to argue that maybe Denisovans were also widely spread within the tropics. So this perhaps remains the most intriguing um, case so far. I would, I would still argue that at present there is no direct evidence that shows Denisovans were living in these difficult environments. This particular jaw actually comes from, well, it was, it was found by a monk with, and then removed from a site and actually this is relatively poorly known and also as a result of tectonic uplift it would have actually been at a lower the cave would have been at a lower altitude in the past as it is today so the jury is still out but dennis Irvins look to be a potentially interesting candidate for maybe refuting our hypothesis in the future but currently i would argue that there is no direct evidence at this point in time so what happens then when we move to our own species and compare it to these other examples well place where my, my eyes in terms of doing lots of research is the, is the tropical rainforest and the fact that our species has actually been shown to have remarkable um, long-term record in these settings. And what's been interesting is that in general, archaeologists and paleoanthropologists have sort of ruled out rainforests as sort of attractive to our species. As we can see literature uh, backgrounds, we tend to think of them as wild, think of the jungle book where, um, they're seen as a real wilderness, or, or if not that, an area where, as you in the background, ruins of human society lie. And so they're seen as generally hostile barriers to human activity, and this has been a long-standing um, thing. Not surprisingly, they're also incredibly challenging to do field work in, and this is a photo from my good colleague, Vida Kuzmatono, who was doing uh, excavation work in Kalimantan, and see the, the sort of lengths they had to go to to transport their excavation equipment just to get to their sites. And this has obviously, unsurprisingly, put many archaeologists off here, particularly given that ultimately the preservation conditions due to high humidity um, and very high temperatures has meant that organic remains as well as biological sites are, are thought to maybe not be as well preserved. By contrast, a lot of uh, discussions of human origins have actually been in settled sites, so particularly in, in, in Africa, South Africa, North Africa, a lot of the early evidence of so-called uh, modern human behavior um, has come from sites like Blanc, Southern Cape Coast. And here it's been seen that the rich protein resources of these coastal sites might have provided a sort of ideal source of sustenance for humans to experiment with new technologies, new ways of, of presenting themselves and new social networks. Alternatively, as in the general core of evolution, our species has been linked to a sort of emergence of grasslands um, and things like that. 
But as myself and Mike Petraglia pointed out in a paper in 15, it's actually remarkable the degree to which there are a number of early uh, sites linked with our species um, that actually are situated within what are covered zones today. Of course, one of the problems at, at, in 2015 was that many of the climate records were poorly known, so that, of course, the rainforest might have shifted in the past. Um, or also, potentially, that humans were just very mobile and using rainforest as just one part of a, a strategy in, in similar ways to perhaps Homo erectus and other hominids. And so what my, my doctorate work focused on in Sri Lanka was trying to get a more direct record where we could actually definitively prove that some of these early human sites located in tropical rainforests and that our ancestors were using these environments um, in quite an intensive way. And to do this, we used um, stable isotope analysis, human fossils and associated animals. And you, I'm sure you've heard about stable isotope analysis, but just to give a quick recap, this, principle, this, this methodology basically operates on the idea that there are two different isotopes of a given element. In this case, it's carbon. And what's important about these two different isotopes is they actually have different masses. And this, the, the sort of lighter isotope, carbon-12, shown in this very uh, sophisticated graphic, um, will move much faster um, in chemical reactions in general, slower, heavier counterpart, carbon-13. And what this means is that at the end of certain reactions, these isotopes will end up having different proportions or different amounts relative to each other than there was in the original sort of products going into that reaction. And we measure this with this sort of delta 13C symbol you might have seen. Uh, it might look complicated, but actually all it simply refers to is the ratio or the relative proportions of these different isotopes in a given um, sample. And what's very nice about carbon isotopes particularly is that through plants and then through animals, they're actually divided in terms of environmental conditions. So perhaps most familiar to us is, is between the C3 and C4 plant pathways. What this basically means, these are plants that follow different manners of photosynthesis. And the number next to the C basically just refers to the number of carbon atoms in the first sugar that's produced by the plant from photosynthesis. But what's nice is process of photosynthesis actually discriminates against the different isotopes I just presented, meaning that the heavier and lighter isotopes have different relative proportions, two different types of, of um, plants. And so, for example, things like wheat or in a salvation context, rice as well, would have a much lower ultimate 13C value than, say, maize, which has a higher value, or as well as millet. But beyond crops, there's also environmental distribution. So almost all tropical forest environments are composed of C3 vegetation. By contrast, a more open, say, savanna settings, that's when the station um, comes into things. Furthermore, even within C3 plants, when we're talking about sort of more open versus forest environments, there are actually the lowest, the C3 plants with the lowest values um, can be distinguished again due to sort of shading, due to the dense canopy as the recycling of CO2. And this means that the lowest um, delta 13C values we see in C3 plant systems can be found in dense tropical forests. But what this gives us is a tool um, in which we can explore the degree to which an animal or a plant is living in different environments and how forested those environments are. So we apply this to the remarkable fossil record of, of Sri Lanka. And the other nice thing is when we do this with teeth, which are firstly the best preserved, um, particularly perhaps more challenging preservation contexts, but they also, because they form sequentially, by taking samples up the vertical edge of a tooth, we can actually explore human death through time or while that tooth is forming, which allows us to get to these questions of whether the humans were moving between different environments or not. And so we applied this to the record of Sri Lanka. As you can see, what's, what's remarkable about the island is the degree to which there's such environmental variation in a relatively small space. But amazingly, the earliest records of our species, our fossil records of our species associated with these beautiful bone tools that were also uh, some of the earliest bow and arrow technology outside of Africa just last week. Um, What's amazing is that they all come from the, what is today covered by rainforest. And actually, currently, these are the earliest Homo sapiens fossils anywhere in South Asia. 
and they're in a rainforest environment. We obviously know that humans were into India, for example, much earlier. But interesting that the earliest fossils we have are in this context. Now, you might see looking at that map that, of course, one argument could be, well, yes, the rainforest moved in the past. Alternatively, given how close some of these sites to the edge of the rainforest are, maybe humans just moved in between different environments. And so this was a sort of ideal test for our isotopic magic. So what you can see on, on, on this particular plot are, are animals from the different um, sites in Sri Lanka. And they're plotted by color by sort of environmental zone. So right far on the left hand side is the wet zone, dense tropical rainforest in green. As you can see, as we expected, this sits at the lowest end of the scale. Then in the orange um, and red, we have a sort of more open, dry, what's called an intermediate rainforest. So again, still towards the lower end, a bit more drier, a bit more open, and we can see that too. And then on the far right-hand side and a little higher, we see animals living in an open environment. So this is what we would expect from grassland setting, obviously much higher in carbon isotopes, but also as well in oxygen isotopes as well. So what happens when we we plot our sort of fossil record as well as our ancient animals over this sort of nice baseline. Well, this is the earliest human fossil we had at the time uh, from the site of Bastombalena, dating to 6,000 years ago. Probably with new Bayesian methodologies, it's about 38,000 years ago. As you can see, despite what might have been expected, it is firmly located within the wet zone rainforest environment. And what's interesting is that the animals associated with it, so that the, the population around at the time was hunting, actually spread across all three environments. And yet the majority of what this human was eating was com still coming from the rainforest. So in a way, humans were actively choosing to live in these environments that had so traditionally been called um, sort of barriers or unattractive. When we move to the last glacial maximum, we see that this changes Slightly, we can wet zone animals move a little bit towards the intermediate area, as do the humans. Um, this is to be expected because during the last glacial maximum, tropical forests in general, drier conditions, a little bit of fragmentation and opening up. But what's interesting is that still none of the humans move out into that C4 grassland space. They remain these tropical forests, albeit slightly drier environments. This continues in the terminal Pleistocene, early Holocene. And in a way, what's really nice is this exception that proves the rule is that the only two humans we find that occupy this C4 space are two humans that arrive in the Iron Age, um, farming, which is a C4 crop. Um, and even then, humans around at the same time, some other humans were still using tropical forest environments, even once agriculture had arrived. And so this really overturned ideas that, that humans will always try and get towards this grassland open setting whenever they have the chance. The Sri Lankan record remarkably shows they were even act actively choosing to live in tropical rainforest habitats. And we could also test the question of were they sort of moving during maybe this sort of the, the single sample was just a sort of average but no, actually, when we even look at the sequential samples, you can see that in terms of carbon isotopes, they really don't change through the sort of sequence of the tooth. So now we've sort of overturned the idea that humans couldn't or didn't want to live. That then gives us a whole series of opportunities to actually see, well, maybe, maybe from our very first evolution, we were living in these environments as well as others. So some tantalized Central and West Africa. Um, often based on these sort of so-called Lupemban toolkits um, that, have, that have since the early 2000s also been linked with rainforest habitation. Although again, sadly, currently there is no direct evidence of how these tools were used, nor is there any good local environmental evidence either. Scholars like Nicholas Taylor, as you can see from the map on the past, to argue, well, actually, yes, but if you, if you took a sort of extent of these rainforests in drier periods, most of these little toolkits are again found in more sort of open grassland woodland settings. So the case very much still remains out on this early um, sort of period of African rainforest occupation, which is early as 200,000 years ago, and we need more evidence. But it obviously wouldn't necessarily be too surprising anymore. At a site over in Kenya called Pangea Saidi, we're located relatively near to the coast. Again, if that coastal idea was right, that humans were really focused on coastal resources. Um, to move within 
in Africa and move Africa, we would expect humans to show a real reliance on the coast. What we actually found when we applied the ice steps again is a more mixed sort of focus on tropical, but also more mixed with grassland settings, but no evidence for coastal resource use. Um, so again, suggesting that humans were using more complex environments. One of the earliest classic examples, of course, is the near caves that you might have heard of, which is a record dating from around 50 to 45,000 years ago in Borneo that was probably one of the really truly show that humans were exploiting tropical rainforest resources. They were focusing on these sort of wild boar, but also detoxifying poisonous plants as well. A remarkable record of sort of human flexibility adapting to these environments and obviously stands in stark contrast to the evidence we have for Homo erectus in its relatively similar um, area. Most recently has perhaps been the suggestion of this leader Adja, human roughly around 70,000 years ago. This human was also argued to be associated with rainforest resources. Um, currently that is based only on the fact that it was washed with a series of orangutan remains. And again, there is still direct information lacking, but potentially if this is indeed 70, 75,000 years old, it's not only the uh, human in Southeast Asia, but it's also the earliest potential human um, to show direct uh, interaction with the rainforest habitat. Similarly, when we get on to Oceania and New Guinea, some of the earliest uh, evidence of human arrival around 45,000 years ago is again linked to a rainforest environment. This time, mountain forest environments that actually can even freeze in winter. So not only is our species able to sort of inhabit tropical rainforests, it can also inhabit very different tropical, depending on where in the world it is as well. So that's tropical rainforest, which I think really set my interest at least off in that maybe there's something unique about our species ecologically. There is no other evidence for any of the other hominins doing anything like that. And so what happens when we look at these other environmental settings? So another sort of extreme set may, of course, be, be deserts. Uh, Michael Petraglia's work, who, who I believe was talking to you a bit earlier, um, has been working in fear. And again, like tropical rainforest, deserts have also been, often been neglected as archaeological sites of interest because, well, it looks as if today no one would really them. But of course, work like Mike's in Saudi Arabia has shown that the climate was very different in the past. And at various points in time, huge networks of rivers and lakes would have been potentially making them traversable by hominins. So for example, in Arabia, when these climate models are applied <coughs> and actually took place, they were found that there was actually lots of archeological sites associated potentially along these rivers mapped by people like Paul Breeze and Nick Drake as part of it as well. But this would, in some ways, sort of go against that hypothesis. They're really getting into deserts when it's wet, as you can see from this thing on the, uh, this graph on the right hand side, that the archaeological sites are sort of almost unanimously, although not entirely, dated to periods when it's estimated that things would have been wetter. Now, Mike's project also uncovered evidence for some of the earliest hominin occupation in Saudi Arabia that actually extends back to 300. 100,000 years or 200 uh, or so thousand years ago at the site of Tis el Gada. Um, now, this was is thought as, as dating to 300,000 years of different hominin as being not our species um, currently. Now, here we were able to use oxygen isotopes to try and explore the degree to which this early hominin occupation was during a time of um, slightly wetter conditions or, or whether it was they were able to adapt to these drier settings. And this time we were using oxygen isotopes. These work on a similar principle to the carbon isotopes in a sense that this time it's the lighter oxygen isotope 16 versus the heavier oxygen isotope 18 and how they interact through differences of the water cycle. So for example, it's quite intuitive in the sense that as evaporation occurs, the water left behind has more of it, which evaporates more slowly, which means that the rainwater is lighter, if you like, or has lower values than the water from which it evaporates. So that makes sense. It continues as these clouds move inland and they rain. The rain that falls is heavier. If you think of like the heavier isotope is heavier, so it will fall more off than the lighter isotope, which stays behind. And so then progressively as we get inland, the cloud water becomes 
more uh, lower and lower and the rain, um, as the rain rains out. But what's also important is that once the rain has fallen into a certain uh, environment, let's go back, there's a slightly different um, value between, say, water lying in a, in a lake or a, or a pond and water that gets its way in plants. And this is because plants are, um, water is evaporating from the leaves of these plants, this process called transpir evapotranspiration. And again, the same process happens. The uh, oxygen isotope is more commonly left behind than the lighter isotope, which leaves the plant. And this means that the plant water, and then therefore the plant tissues, have a higher in isotope ratio than um, the groundwater. And this increases even more as things like aridity and sunlight um, cause evaporation, evapotranspiration to speed up. And what this means is that when we look at oxygen isotopes, of, we can actually do something quite refined when we look at animals that get their water from open water sources. And animals like the Arabian oryx, pictured here, get their water from plant water. Because what we can do is we can actually see that this evaporation effect, or i.e. the aridity of the landscape, is actually the difference between the open water and the plant water. And so if we can measure animals that are drinking the open water, and we can measure animals that are drinking the plant water, so we can actually look at differences between them to estimate how arid this environment was. And this is exactly what we did. So we compared the oryx to some ancient equids as well at the same site. Oops. And so this is a plot of um, non-obligate drinkers of those animals drinking, uh, getting their water from plants and all drinkers are the ones that have to drink. They have to drink open water sources. So what you can see in the third sort of uh, graph to the, to the right, um, you can see that in modern array, obviously the difference between the two is huge as a result of this obviously very high aridity impact in a desertic setting. But when we get to the site of Tisal Gado, which is one, we see that actually this was much reduced 300,000 years ago. And actually it was reduced to a level where when we compare it to modern animals sampled in Eastern Africa, so at the sites of like Kitsavo, for example, roughly the level of aridity at this time at Tisalgado is about what we would expect in an Eastern African relatively dry savanna today. So that's pretty amazing that we can actually look at, at these kind of questions. And so then the evidence of these stone tools and the use of bones um, of these early populations is actually associated during a period where the environments were much the same as, as, as Eastern Africa is at least today. And so this going back to what I began the talk with, with actually this early hominin range expansion was not so impressive, perhaps. By contrast, the work that Matthew Stewart is currently uh, doing here in Yenna is showing or hinting that by the time our species gets into Arabia from at least 80,000 years ago, it is of course getting in there when there is groundwater available, but the current animals associated with it seem to be hinting that it might have been a drier setting than it was when these earlier Tisalgada communities arrived. So there's some tantalizing hints that maybe our species was adapting to drier settings in Arabia than its predecessors, but this remains to be conclusively tested. And what's evidence of, of sort of lots of archeological sites now being found even within the Sahara, and this is again, thanks to the work of, of, of Nick Drake um, and Ellie Shkeri is that um, these river and lake systems to um, the sort of available archeological sites. We can again see that they're located along these sort of paleo rivers, paleo land up. We currently, again, don't really have necessarily good environmental inf information actually associated with the archeological sites as yet. So it's hard to tell the degree to which uh, these sites were arid or not, but it re remains an area of, of interest, I think, for investigating this in the future. And this is again just showing that at the moment, the humans were getting through the Sahara when it was a bit wetter, but how wet and what was the environment like? If, if there was just a river, but still relatively porous vegetation, that still says something about stability um, as well. Perhaps the most fascinating desertic information to come to light so far is some of the early evidence um, from in Botswana and Namibia, where it's actually been shown that humans were occupying lakeshore sites at the times when these lakes were fading, when even the conditions were driest. And so this would seem to potentially fit with the hints 
being found in Arabia that our own species could do or adapt to more arid settings um, in a greater way than, than its predecessors could as well. Of course, in a South Asian context, the tar desert remains particularly exciting for expression further. Um, there appears to be very early uh, lower, middle, uh, and late Paleolithic assemblages here. So one key question, I think, to explore moving, do these different stone tool assemblages, uh, are they associated with different environments or not? Can we, can we somehow measure the levels of aridity um, that these different hominin missions are, are adapting to as they arrive um, in this part of the subcontinent? Another area that's been almost completely underexplored in this regard is the Gobi Desert. So you might be aware that some of the discussions of the earliest human arrival into, say, North China actually argue for this sort of purple route, if you, if you can see, or, or that basically um, moving through Siberia, our species completely Gobi Desert, and then came back into China from the northwest. Meanwhile, other populations and seems earlier human populations were moving through to the south, um, potentially as early as 100,000 years ago. Now, one paper that, that our Chinese colleagues uh, and ourselves published back in, in, in 2019 also made the, well, is it not possible, given these other evidence from deserts around the world, that actually there is some complex human hominin population interactions going, occurring within this big side of the Gobi Desert? And there are some hints of archaeological sites or surface sites that may suggest that, that indeed populations were moving through this, um, this area of the past um, and not necessarily around the north. But this remains something that requires further investigation. But I think overall what we can see is that even desert tropical rainforests are becoming increasingly interesting sites for exploring what it means to be human or the degree to which our species could adapt in ways that others could not. Another example is, is the Paleoarctic, and, and this interesting research by um, Petulko et al. in 2016 showed that there's potentially cut mark bones found as 5,000 years ago beyond the Arctic Circle. Uh, there's some controversy about these remains, but that would be pretty remarkable if so. And the paleoenvironmental evidence would suggest that also we're living in this area at around about the point when, when glaciers were still extending. And we also see this later um, through Siberia when. There's a clear option for the exploitation of mammoths, um, even to build houses like the one uh, shown on the right-hand side there. And this may be linked to a, a really specialized adaptation of animals which could actually break through the permafrost that could get nutrition from relatively um, nutrition poor if you're not able to exploit the grasses of environments. And that humans were really developing adaptations um, that, that followed these animals as well. Similarly, Interesting question got into North America. Um, it's often discussed that they first got there through a coastal uh, highway because that's the only way they could supposedly get there fast enough. Um, but at some of the earliest sites, indeed one of the earliest sites in Canada found now around 14,000 years ago, is actually shown up in an area where it would have been cold. And it's possible that continued this sort of following of the large mammals they were doing so in Siberia through across this corridor actually an overland cold adaptation. But again, this remains to be properly elucidated, but it's, but it's certainly possible, I think, now that we can see that humans could, could also have arrived simply when it was, when it was cold um, as well. They need not have all focused on the coast. And this was an interesting site that I learned about quite recently. We obviously don't necessarily hear about the environmental adaptations of different hominins in Europe too much. But actually, there's a fascinating Upper Paleolithic site at the site of Breitenbach that is found, as you can sort of see, right on the edge of where glaciers came up during the Pleistocene. So you can see just those yellow is sort of the bit that was left by um, the glaciers, and, and the more green is, is this bit that eroded away. Uh, uh, glaciers sort of eroded this, 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 um, the, the rock systems around. And you can see that Brighton Brick sits right on this kind of boundary. It's for human use of ivory, hunting of things like Arctic foxes, for quite a long period of time at this site, again, perhaps suggesting even in Europe, there are, there are certain sites that might provide that show our species was able to really adapt flexibly to different environments. Yeah, and this, this graph just, this just shows that the, the 
side of uh, Brighton back to some extent was also um, occupied during a period when things would have been quite cold as well. And just to finish up with then, another extreme environment is potentially these high altitude settings. So this is the mountain kingdom of Lesotho uh, in southern Africa. All of its land mass is located above 2,000 uh, meters above sea level. It really is a fascinating place to go and visit um, and beautiful, beautiful landscapes. And what's interesting now is that there's now records of humans uh, occupying Lesotho as early as 75,000 years ago. So living at a relatively high altitude, dealing with what are relatively difficult or challenging montane environmental zones um, during this time period, even alpine zones. Um, and we have also, so isotopic ever shows later on, they were even surviving in these areas through the last glacial maximum, which saw a, a temperature change as much as about um, seven degrees centigrade. So our species was clearly incredibly adapted to Lesotho, at least by the terminal Pleistocene, and it looks um, potentially earlier. And, and it, we actually, maybe it's this focus on freshwater resources in Lesotho kept humans um, living up high in these areas, entering out into these sort of drier areas to the west that during glacial conditions would have actually had difficulty in accessing fresh water. And so that although they were in the cold, um, it was worth it to try and hang on to a reliable access to water. And uh, one of the sites at Hong Kong, there's a record of sort of humans using freshwater fish um, as well, um, as early as around 20, 25,000 years ago. Recently exciting paper that showed that our species had also made it into the Ethiopian highlands um, and was able to adapt to the sort of mountainous settings up there um, and had direct environmental evidence associated with this occupation that suggested that again, they were adapting to these relatively um, resource poor um, settings. Uh, moving beyond Africa, there's also now evidence from the Tibetan Plateau between 40 and 30,000 years ago that definitively place Homo up on these mountainous environments in perhaps the, uh, one of the mountain, most mountainous examples, um, particularly in Asia at least, with making up that material culture. And then of course we have the Andes, which is occupied immensely early when we consider the sort of tempo of human occupation of the Americas. There's evidence for humans in the high Andes, um, indeed, between about 13 and, and 12,000 years ago. So they made it remarkably rapidly up into these montane environments. Again, again show a sort of predilection to explore and, and, and populations to specialize in different settings long before they were actually forced to by, say, um, increasing uh, population like that. So ultimately, reviewing this evidence, I would argue um, that there is clear um, indication that all do things ecologically that no other hominin species could. Um, and getting back to this idea of the generalist specialist, by this, what we wanted to do is sort of compare logical designations for different species, where you have sort of generalists like the raccoon. So they're sort of species that can inhabit lots of different environment individuals of that species can even go off and do lots of very different things um, or versus the specialist where you have a sort of population and a species that formerly today like the panda uh, although it, it would have been slightly different in the past but today is now almost entirely reliant upon bamboo by contrast our species to fit in either of these categories it's a generalist in the sense that it could inhabit not only grasslands not only coastal settings but also high altitude environments, deserts, and tropical uh, rainforests. But it couldn't only just do that. Populations of Homo, Homo sapiens could actually specialize themselves in the habitation of these environments. And so if you were able to look at our recent Sri Lankan paper, what's quite remarkable is that we find that yes, there's this evidence for human specialization in the rain, but they were simultaneously most likely communicating with a group living on the coast. So already our species had these remarkable social networks. And what I would argue this provided is that as a whole then, even if one of these populations, say living in the desert, suddenly was extirpated or suddenly could no longer survive, there were so many different populations of our species environments that as a whole, our species had a great chance to succeed and thrive um, overall.
but this is the hypothesis we want to put out there and, and, and we want it to be controversial. We want it to be tested. Um, we want to really encourage that, that next time people are going out and spying a fossil or trying to publish it in nature or a genome, that they're thinking about, well, what is the environment that goes with this, right? What, yes, we found the earliest example of X here, but what does that mean? What does that mean in an ecological sense? What does that mean in terms of our species being distinctive? And so we really want to throw this out there. Like I said earlier, there is some evidence that maybe our hypothesis will ultimately be wrong. So it's evidence from this new Denisovan jawbone, potentially suggests Denisovans evolved um, in a low oxygen, high altitude environment, much like members of our species can. But again, I would argue that currently this is still indirect, but it is a thing, assertion. Um, yes, and, and one ultimately interesting argument that, that say, for example, the geneticists are wrong and we are the same species as Neanderthals and Denisovans, then that would mean that actually that whole complex would be the ultimate generalist, right? Because we would not only have been able to be so flexible culturally, um, but we would have even had this, this significant biological variation as well that allowed us to have different contexts. So I think at the moment it is very clear that Homo sapiens, or at least Homo sapiens as we know it in the fossil record, does have something unique about it. The, the ways in which it can um, so frequently and flexibly adapt to different ecological circumstances. So another question, where else should we look to try and test this question further? So I touched upon it briefly, but obviously Central and West Africa remain a really exciting area um, for exploring this question in tropical settings. When did our species first get into tropical rainforests? It's almost undoubtedly going to be found in this part of the world. As I mentioned before, comparative desert information, the Gobi Desert is going to be fascinating, especially as it's situated in a location where potentially Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and Denisovans were interacting parts of this region at the same time. South America, I briefly touched upon, um, but it's obviously the sort of last prayer for our species during the Pleistocene. And what's remarkable is it seems that once it got there, it could rapidly get into the Amazon, the Andes, and even the deserts of um, Chile within about 2,000 years, which is remarkable, unless, of course, we accept the slightly earlier dates of 20,000 years ago. But what is um, currently discussions of the early human appearance in South America is, has not really been compared again with environmental records. And so we have sort of, again, a relatively limited understanding of what kind of ways in which our species is adapted and how quickly. So that's certainly an area to explore as this sort of last journey um, as Jose Ziriati, new ER subject, is looking to explore um, there. And of course the world. What I think this hypothesis opens up is that actually uh, it's important to study our species as well as other hominins wherever we find them. And that it's again not trying to search necessarily for the first example of certain things but rather what are the hominins associated with where we find them? Even in areas like Europe, um, is, it, uh, is one of the hominins associated with settings than another? Or, you know, no, using this hypothesis, the basic idea is to take the simple fact that our species is the only hominin to have occupied the world and test the degree to which or the speed to which that was meaningful in terms of adaptation, right? That do we, when we go back to the Pleistocene, how diverse were the habitats um, it was in. We now have a pretty strong record that they were very diverse by at least 70 to 45,000 years ago. But what about earlier? And then, of course, the question of what drove it. Um, this is where, of course, um, finding symbolic material culture, complex technologies remains incredibly important. Certainly not saying that we should shy away from that, but simply placing them in their wider context, their wider ecological context, I think becomes increasingly um, crucial. And so is that simultaneously around about this time, researchers are focusing on um, plasticity as an ecological thing. There's also neuroscientists looking at neuroplasticity. And this is the idea that the human brain is uniquely able to not necessarily do again, certain things better than say the Neanderthals, but the idea that form connections faster between these different parts of the brain. 
And so we see that in things like um, there are studies on London taxi drivers showing that sort of their eight parts of connections between parts of their brain form as they're learning routes around London. Or when someone loses a limb, for example, it's amputated, they see that the brain is able to adapt new connections. And this is where these things like phantom limb syndrome come from as well. So it may be that this neuroplasticity, this ability for the brain to keep constantly wrapping, um, even changing through life to actually be a unique trait, again, that links in with this ecological plasticity. Similarly, our species clearly shows ever forming more complex social networks that would undoubtedly have helped it to rapidly adapt to tropical forest settings. This kind of preserve knowledge through different genes, for example, um, with, with scholars showing that things like the campfire are immensely important for passing down um, generational knowledge would have undoubtedly enabled adaptations, these specialized adaptations to keep being so successful. Similarly, things like symbolism would enable communication with other populations of homeless, allowing either support networks during difficult times or also the maintenance of territory and, and um, adaptations in that way. And then finally, things like the bow and arrow still seems to be something unique to our species. Earliest evidence is, is around 64,000 years in South Africa, and then the paper we published in, in Sri Lanka um, takes it to 48 there. So there are also certain uh, novel technological compositions that also would have undoubtedly enabled our species to um, succeed in these very different environments, hunting very different prey. And then finally, how can we study it? Well, I've tried throughout, you know, my work is, is based on stable isotope analysis, and I've tried to show in a different way to be applied to explore these questions. But of course, there are other technologies. So you might have, um, there's obviously basic zooarchaeological analyses, macro botanics that might seem um, to some extent old fashioned in the age of ancient DNA. But actually, again, I would argue that these are crucial to understand the environments that these different hominins are moving. Um, with techniques such as zooms, so zooms by mass spectrometry, we're now able to go through lots of fragments of different bones. And even where preservation might be poor in some more challenging environments, we can actually still build up very interesting um, compilations of what species was present and biodiversity and things like that. And here we go. Here's the microbotany. And then, of course, also the importance of producing um, on-site records. So often these discussions of human evolution are done for focusing on marine core and ice core, looking at broad glacial interglacial fluctuations. But the problem is with those is that while they give you well-dated insights into global changes, they are not reflecting the environments in which humans are living. So for that, we actually have to track these ecological settings into an on-site setting or using lake records that are associated with human behavior. And I think that's something we also have to improve as well moving forward, because I think identifying climate changes in a, in a marine or ice no longer enough um, to actually show what's happening to the plants and animals and environments in an area that humans are actually inhabiting. And finally, I would, I would also, in, in this context, point towards these fascinating studies being led by people like Svante Pabo's lab and Matthias Mayer, where the, the interest is in exploring a genome or what the genome shows about population interactions, but what the genome means for adaptations. So, for example, some of this work is showing fantastic insights into the, the thing about the Denisovans I mentioned, so the idea that actually the, the gene for modern Tibetans that is linked to um, adaptation to high altitude environments actually potentially comes from Denisovan populations, or maybe uh, early members of our species passing them to a Denisovan population that then came um, back down to modern populations. Similarly, in the Andes, we see similar patterns of that there are certain areas of the genome that change to allow populations to inhabit more extreme environments. So I think that's an interesting area moving forward is what areas of these genomes that we're finding may have adaptive significance. And I think that's some research that's starting to be done in terms of comparing Neanderthals and humans, and now also Denisovans and humans. And I think that's a really exciting um, development. Just to sort of add in some provisos at the end, of course, one thing we have to bear in mind is, is, is can this be a true comparison as a result of, of data issues? For example, this is a <coughs> isotope plot we made in an evolutionary anthropology paper in 2016. And what it shows is the sort of carbon isotope values, um, in this case, 
corrected back to the vegetation these hominins were consuming for different hominins that currently exist. So mainly in Africa. So you can see sort of on the left-hand side, some of you might be with Sivapithecus um, and also Gigantopithecus. And you can see that they had isotope values broadly similar to sort of modern day chimpanzees and gorillas. So very forested. You can then see that all of the hominins we have isotope data for in Africa show a broad trend moving away from woodland forest environments up towards uh, slightly open grassland environments. But again, interestingly, that none of them are actually exploiting dense forest canopies, as far as we can tell, and certainly not exclusively. And actually, it's only a species that seems to be able to come back and really specialize in these environments. So showing the data from uh, Sri Lanka there, as well as from some Holocene hunter-gatherers, John Krigbaum and Alania Caves. But of course, one thing we have to bear in mind is that in some ways, this isn't a fair comparison in the sense that the species before Homo sapiens are all representing uh, maybe say, in some cases, five individuals for a whole hominin species, whereas in the context of Homo sapiens, we're talking about just one population. So obviously we need to improve our data sets and, and some of these comparisons have to be made cautiously. There's also the argument that potentially we're finding such brilliant records of ecological evolution and, and, and complex material culture because all of our Homo sapiens records are actually from cave sites, whereas many of those we find for earlier hominins contemporaneous hominins are actually in more open air sites and so this would obviously also bias preservation in open air settings and it may be um, all that, that our ancestors or relatives were actually preferring these more open lakeshore environments. I think at the moment it, it looks that that probably isn't the case because we do sites for earlier hominins in cases such as um, Liang Bua for the Hobbit and um, Wunderwerk Cave for example, in Africa for Homo erectus or other members of Homo. Um, and they still fit with this general pattern. So, so at the moment, I still feel very confident saying that our species is ecologically unique and was able to environments like no other. But I think there are, some, there are obviously some areas um, we have for improvement. And also, like I say, I'm very happy um, to be proven wrong. If you take up the paleo environmental work in areas of South Asia and beyond, that will go forward to testing these kind of hypotheses as well. So with that, I'm gonna to to really thank the organizers once again for this opportunity, as well as all of my colleagues mentioned here as well. Thank you.